Hello and welcome to Salt War Gaming. I'm in front of the camera for a change because I'm actually going to be working on a new series of videos which is going to be called Bootcamp and in these videos I'll actually be showing you how to play a range of different games. Now, when I was trying to think of the, the first game to show in this series I thought, well, seeing as how Dreadball Season 4 has come out and also Dreadball Extreme is coming out at the end in March um, I thought, why not show you how to play Dreadball? So, uh, here in front of me I have a Dreadball pitch and I'll be kind of showing you, uh, through a series of videos, different mechanics of the games and introducing new features as we go along. And then probably in the finale there'll be some sort of like um, uh, kind of demonstration video as well. So, for the first video in the series I'm actually going to be looking at just the board and some of the basic mechanics of the game, just to give you a feel as to what the game's about. So here we have the uh, the Dreadball pitch. Now, first thing before we carry on, uh, yours might look slightly different from mine because mine is actually the Azure Forest Special Edition. Um, it's exactly the same in terms of functionality. All the tiles are the exact same except from the, the pitch is a slightly different colour and texture. So uh, now that's cleared up, let's actually move on to the pitch. As you can see, the whole pitch is kind of separated into these little hexagonal little tiles, which is what you use to kind of move and calculate distances and how far you can move and all things like that. Um, each side of the board has these three areas. Now these are known as strike zones. Now these are the areas where you want to get your players with the ball in order to score. Now there are two sets, you've got the white and the red. Now the white is actually the home team, the red is the away team. Uh, but apart from that they're the exact same. Um, this central line in the middle which says the DB is actually where you kind of deploy your forces, well, your teams at the beginning of the game. So the uh, the away team will deploy all this, this side of the line and the home team will deploy this side of the line. When the game begins, the, uh, the ball is actually fired along the middle here and it can, depending on what you roll, it can either get to one, two, three, four, five, or it can bounce off and go either side. So, in terms of keeping track of the, the game and the scores, we have this uh, scoreboard at the top which kind of goes from seven to zero to seven. Now the reason this is because every time that you score in Dreadball, your counter moves one way towards you. Now, if, the, if your opponent scores, then it moves one way back to them. Essentially, it's kind of you keeping how many additional points you have over your enemy rather than an actual score. However, if you reach seven points, um, the game automatically ends and you win straight away. On the other side of the board, we have this uh, 1 to 14, and those are the, t the actual rush markers. So every time that you play a rush, you move it forward, and then once it gets to 14, that's the end of the game, and whoever's got the, the most points wins. At either end of the pitch we have um, these four boxes, so we've got um, the 3 two, one box there, 3 two, one box there, and then an empty box there. Now the empty box is actually your subs bench. Now this is because your team is usually consist of eight players. However, you can only ever have six players on the field at any given time. So two of the players should, sit, should be in the subs bench at the beginning of the game. And we also have this kind of area here, which is basically the sin bin. Um, if any of your players get injured during the game, or um, some, I think they can get sent there for fouls or things like that, but that's more of the advanced rules, uh, they get placed into one of these uh, three sections. Now depending on how severe the injury was or the foul, they'll have to sit in three, two or one. Then at the end of each rush they move down, uh, so if they start in three, the end of the next rush they move to two, the end of the next rush they move to one, and then they're back in the subs bench, and then they can enter the game again. So that's what these boxes are for at the end of each table. I briefly mentioned earlier about the strike zones and basically uh, the way you score in this is you need to get your player to any of these um, the hexes, any of these ones here, and you need to throw your ball into this end one there. Now if you throw your ball from either any of these, um, how many is there, seven hexes, uh, you get one point. If you get it from here you actually get a uh, three points as it's, it's a harder throw to throw from there to there than it is from any other place. Now if you actually get to this uh, end hex, or this one here, um, you can actually get a bonus point for, for whatever you do. So for example if you score from uh, the bonus hex here you actually get four points and if you score from any of these seven here you actually get two points. So you, whilst it's uh, good to kind of go for the small points because they're closer to your table and usually it's easy to get to to get from these ones. Uh, if you can make that extra mile and get to here then it's always worth trying to get to here for those big points. So that was the board. Um, let's focus on some of the kind of basic mechanics such as dice rolling next. In the Dreadball box you get three sets of coloured dice. You get white for the home team, red for the away team, and also some coaching dice. Now these coaching dice are given to each coach at the beginning of each rush and they can use these to kind of uh, modify additional, uh, boost some of the certain actions by adding an extra dice in there. 
Now, before I kind of focus on those a little bit more, I'll put those to one side. The basic premise of dice rolling in Dreadball is the fact that you tend to always roll three dice. Now, you can actually end up rolling more or less dice depending on any modifiers, but you always start with three dice and then modifiers are added or removed afterwards. So, for example, if I was to chew a, um, try and tackle an opponent, I would get the three dice, um, and my opponent would also get three dice if they were going counter offer, but we're just focusing on the one action. So I've got three dice, um, the model that I'm trying to tackle with is a guard, so they get an additional dice, and they're also, they've also moved the previous turn so they get another dice there. So that gives me five dice altogether to use. Um, so rather than actually adding plus one to what your values are, you just add dice instead. Now whenever you use dice in Dreadball, you're always rolling against the stat line of your particular player, depending on what action you're doing. Now going back to the tackle that I've meant, um, used an example before, um, you would use the strength value of your character. So for example, if I'm using the, um, the Corporation Guard, who's a human, his strength value is a 4+, plus, which means that on these dice I need to get four, uh, 4 or more to succeed. So it's not a case of you get 3 dice and you need to, his plus 1 for being a guard or plus 1 for uh, running in drops down the roll to a plus 2. It's actually always a 4 and you just roll additional dice for it. So um, let's say I was to roll these 5 dice. There's quite a few there, so I've got um, a 5, two sixes, a 2 and a 1. So that gives me three successes. Uh, the 2 and the 1 are discarded because they're not really thought about, but what's also interesting about Dreadball is that you also get any sixes you roll, you get to roll an additional dice for additional successes. So I've got two sixes, so I've got three successes so far, and also get to roll two more dice, and that gives me a 4 and a 3. So now I've got an additional success, and that can just be discarded as well. So that's given me a total of four successes. Now, if one of those additional dice that I rolled then give a 6 again, I would actually just keep rolling dice for every 6 that I get, pretty much until you either run out of dice or it's completely unbeatable for the opponent to win. So I've zoomed in a little bit so we can see better the tiles and how the player relates to them. Now, one of the key things that you'll need to remember whilst playing uh, Dreadball is front arc, rear arcs, and also threat hexes. Now, if you were to draw an imaginary line from the player, so running along here and that way, um, he's facing that way, so the kind of the lines have to run perpendicular to him. Um, this, anything in this area is as in a front arc, and anything in this area is in his rear arc. Now, one of the other things you'll need to remember is the threat hexes. Now, as this player is facing forward, these three front hexes are his threat hexes. Now, what that means is if uh, players try to have run through those threat hexes, then he can, this guy has a chance of kind of tripping them up. So you either want to knock players down so they can't have their threat hexes, or you'll kind of want to avoid them altogether. So one of the things I should probably point out when I'm talking about hexes is the fact that only one player can ever occupy one tile at say, any given time. In front of me here I have a, um, an Orc Guard and the uh, Corporation Guard. Now this player cannot move through this guard, and he has to kind of go around him, and that applies to friendly models as well. So if I've got the um, the friendly guard here, um, in order to get past them, I've either got to go around that way, around that way, or through the middle here. Some players do have special abilities such as backflip, which does allow you to kind of jump over players, but that is kind of a bit of a tricky action to do. So it's not always uh, as easy as running around, but sometimes the situation may call for it. So that was the first part of Dreadball Bootcamp. I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you found it informative. If you didn't, or you wanted me to go into more depth on certain things, uh, please mention that in the comments and I'll take those going forward into future videos. I'm trying to keep these videos kind of uh, small and compact so that you can just quickly come back to them should you need a refresher on any particular rule set. The, the next video that I'll be looking at will involve the players, the different types of players and what they can do, and probably also looking at some of the actions as well. Now that will be a longer video as there is more to cover. So be sure to subscribe to be kept up to date with the latest videos, and also check us out at talkwargaming.com. Thanks for watching and goodbye. <laughs>